Good morning, afternoon, and evening from ITU Geneva, and welcome to the first session or episode of the ITU Satellite Webinars. This one is dedicated to interference to satellite systems, but it's not the only one. So we'll continue then with the NGSO launch constellation, the 7th of October, and with HTS, GSO, and mobility, the 11th of November. We are counting with distinguished experts and executives as speakers and, very importantly, an incredible audience of more than 900 participants registered and which are being connected now. So this, in a way, is proving the need for more and more information, knowledge and data and our commitment to provide it to the ITU membership. Bearing this in mind, we have designed these informative events in a format with presentations and also Q&A and discussions. Now, let me introduce the director of the Radio Communication Bureau, Mr. Mario Maniewicz, who will formally open this event. Thank you very much, uh, Jorge. And uh, I, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all uh, our distinguished speakers, as well as to all participants who are joining this ITUR webinar from around the world. It's really incredible to see how many have joined and uh, you are all welcome uh, to join this first of the series of ITU satellite webinars that is starting today. During the, these three episodes, you'll be taken to the most relevant topics and discussions concerning the exciting field of space services and satellite communications of today and of the years to come. We are proud to count on distinguished experts and organizations supporting these webinars and on you as a valuable audience. As you are aware, the latest World Radio Communication Conference held in Egypt last year was very successful in taking important decisions that will shape the future of radio communication, including space services. A stable regulatory framework was put in place to allow the deployment of large non-GSO constellations not only in the well-known KU and KA bands, but also in higher frequency bands around 40 and 50 gigahertz. GSO satellite networks have also improved the regulatory procedures so that administrations are better positioned when coordinating, licensing, or operating earth stations in motion with the objective to enable broadband connectivity to citizens on board ships, aircraft, and land vehicles, as well as to ensure their safety and security. Dear friends, I'm pleased to announce that the 2020 edition of the radio regulation has been made available for download. This publication incorporates to the international treaty that governs the use of spectrum and satellite orbits, the modifications made by the World Radio Communication Conference of 2019. The radio regulations enable the functioning of all radio communication services, including satellite services, and I strongly encourage you to download it and consult this fundamental legal framework. Looking ahead towards WRC 23, we have initiated studies and the preparatory work that will allow us to benefit from the latest advances in satellite technologies. The agenda for the next conference will consider expanding satellite services to higher frequency bands, better using intersatellite links or suborbital vehicles, accommodating new frequency allocations to space research, Earth exploration and the meteorological satellite services to monitor our planet. These few examples illustrate the need for more, more bandwidth, global harmonization, and its consequent advantages of economies of scale. It is clear that space services that we increasingly rely upon can play a key role to achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals. But to do so, these services needs to be, need to be protected from harmful interference. This is why today's ITU satellite webinar will focus on the dissemination of information on measures to protect satellite system from harmful interference. Dear all, I invite you to enjoy the webinar, participate actively in it, and more importantly, to apply the concepts that you will learn to enable the development of this fascinating field of space services and satellite communications. Have a nice webinar. Thank you, Director of the Radio Communication Bureau. Now we'll move on to the first episode, entering really in the discussions and the presentations we'll have, uh, dealing with the internet interference to uh, satellite systems. Uh, for that purpose, uh, uh, we are counting with uh, distinguished speakers from NASA, uh, Glenn Feldeck from European Space Agency, Elena Daganzo, 
also from uh, UTELSAT for the cases of GSO to Etan Lavan, and finally with uh, for uh, Eurocontrol to get at births. Before going into these details, and while we are uh, waiting for, for more people to connect and to benefit from this webinar, I will try to give you an introduction to this uh, subject by providing you with some information we have in the uh, Bureau, and which will be used to stimulate the discussions and the uh, questions during this uh, webinar. Just a small introduction. <clears throat> so, uh, what we're going to see is a short snapshot of the, the current situation, the ITU initiative to tackle this problem of the interference, an overview of the procedure to, to use in case of carbon interference, and some conclusions. Uh, to summarize in, in one screenshot the, some fact checks related to the space uh, services, we can say that uh, there are more than 50 years of space regulation since the, the first administrative conference was held. Today, there are 68 member states with access to space resources, meaning they have a recorded satellite networks and operating. In total, there is 1,700 satellite networks operating and recorded. A total of 4 terahertz globally of the spectrum coordinated and recorded. And uh, because we need to know uh, the, let's say, the health of the system, we are trying to measure the, the percentage of a spectrum which is free of harmful interference. As you know, ITU R has the main goal of uh, ensuring the uh, operation free of harmful interference. So, based on the reports that we are receiving, we have measured that there is an, uh, around 99.95% in the last four years which is free of harmful interference for the GSO. This seems to be a little bit uh, optimistic. In fact, we know that there, uh, there is a lack of report in some cases. So that's the need or the, our message to try to get more information from you in the sense of uh, measuring the actual situation. Um, we can see that uh, the, with the broken uh, line in orange, in fact, the uh, trend of the affected bandwidth to interference is increasing. At the same time, the percentage or the total capacity which is being recorded is also increasing. This makes a kind of a stable situation in terms of the ratio between the affected bandwidth and the total capacity. You know, it's less than 0.1%. Uh, we can also see in this uh, graph the distribution along the GSO. We have introduced for this purpose a tool called SIRS that we will mention later to, to also uh, capture this information and, and analyze it. So now let's present to you uh, typical cases which are reported to VR, and then they will be addressed by the respective speakers uh, later on. No? So one of the first cases is the fixed satellite service, and the broadcasting satellite service in the C, KU, and KA band. Uh, in those cases, the main reason or cause for, for interference was either the lack of coordination, author unauthorized use, some unnecessary emissions as defined in the number 15.1 of the radio regulation, which is typically high power and not modulated carrier, and sometimes technical operational things like cross-polarization interference. Uh, what is the impact of this? Just trying to illustrate uh, the, the importance is that, for example, if you are watching a, a football match, you may lose a goal. You don't know if it is a goal or not, or you cannot see that well the image. You may have impact in banking transactions. You can also have impact at corporate or working from home levels, as we are doing all today. Uh, this is in terms of FSS and BSS. Uh, we have also received reports in terms of air exploration satellite service passive in 1400 to 1427 megahertz band, for which the cause was either unwanted emissions from radars or other ra radio devices operating in adjacent bands and exceeding le levels contained in the resolution 750. There were some other cases of non-authorized use of CCTV wireless devices, making illegal use of this passive band, no? and they are in contradiction, of course, of the number 5340 of the radio regulations. And there were also a few cases, in, or more cases in, in some localized area about intermediate frequency radiation from BSS receivers due to poor shielding or of cables and connectors. This, this will be expanded later on by the respective uh, speakers. In this latter case, the impact can be either loss of data or collection of wrong information 
about uh, our planet. Another system which is also very important and for which there were reports uh, submitted to the ITU is the Radio Navigation Satellite Service, or RNSS, in the frequency bands of uh, 1.5 gigahertz range and 1.2 gigahertz. Uh, in those cases, uh, according to the information made available to the VR, uh, the reason was either the use of transmitting devices without the required authorization or license, for which the ITU is always encouraging the administration to uh, do a national enforcement of those uh, uh, devices in order to avoid these cases of interference, and also some cases of military exercises or operations near zones of conflict. What is the impact of these cases? Well, the impact is, can be quite significant from affecting uh, airplanes or so ships, or even though any one of us who is using just an application in our personal mobiles or in autonomous vehicles. Uh, we have to remember that the radio regulation states in the provision number 1528 that the absolute international protection of transmissions uses for safety and regulatory of flights. Uh, these are the, the main topics that we will expand later on. We also have received reports on the mobile satellite services in the 1.6, 2, and 2.6 gigahertz, and also concerning radio astronomy services in the 1.6 gigahertz caused by the non-GSO satellite network. If you wish to expand on this subject, you can visit also the VR director's report to the past WRC-19, as it is stated on the bottom. Now, uh, how is ITU tackling this interference problem? We have different uh, fields of action. The first one is the prevention, which is through the ITU study groups, the radio assembly, the World Radio Conference, which the last one, as we said, was held in Egypt recently and was very successful. And once this radio regulation, which by the way, as the director said, was updated and published just yesterday, this radio rights will be applied by both the VR and also the administrations. For example, the coordination investigation procedures. These are just measures for prevention. There are other measures for corrections, for example, the application of the Article 15, and in that case, if it, it cannot be resolved to the radio regulation board. Uh, in addition to that, we have uh, put, uh, uh, we have deployed a SIRS online application, which is to facilitate the reporting, the exchange of information between administrations and provide assistance. And I would like to invite you to visit this website for which the link is here and open an account if you haven't done so and use it. Uh, in addition to that, we are trying to expand more in terms of informative fora as the, the current one we are having now. Uh, the, the objective of this is to raise awareness of the impact of interference and the need for cooperation. Uh, during this uh, informative fora, different uh, solutions are also presented and discussed. Uh, also, we have expanded in terms of international monitoring systems. Today, we are having uh, also cooperation agreements with eight countries. Uh, these are, if I remember well, Germany, Pakistan, Belarus, uh, China, Korea, Oman, and soon with Brazil. Uh, in addition, and finally, for this uh, slide, slide show, we have also to mention that the ITUR sector is providing very useful recommendations, reports, and handbooks. So, if you are dealing with one interference, uh, how to, to do this? How is the process? Uh, in principle, the telecom operators uh, will detect this interference, this harmful interference, and will try uh, to inform the satellite operator, and they will communicate each other to resolve it. And this is mainly the 90% of the cases. But when this cannot be resolved, is when it is escalated to the administration. So administration A is communicating with administration B. And this is also in many cases resolved. In case that this cannot be achieved is when it is arriving to ITU. And for this, we have the constitution, the article 15 and 13.2 to provide assistance. So in this case, ITU is acting between both administrations. And normally most of the cases are uh, dealt in this uh, orange box. Uh, in case this cannot be solved, there is also some other uh, legal instrument uh, in terms of compulsory arbitration and settling of disputes, but fortunately it was never applied as far as I know. So this is in, 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 in brief terms, what is the, the procedure look like? And 
uh, to finalize for this introduction, let me say that, uh, remember that uh, our main objective in ITUR is to ensure operation free of harmful interference. And why? Because, of course, you want to have a successful mission, you want to give a good quality of service to the citizenship and for the companies to ensure also the return of investment. The spectrum free of harmful interference is stable, as we have seen, but due to the, the more and more emerging systems that we are expecting, there is a higher risk of interference. No? The RFI dynamics certainly is, is getting more complex. Uh, that's why we need uh, that you report these cases of interference, so it will allow us to assess the actual situation. And as we have seen and we'll see during the course of today, there are different ser services affected and there are different reasons or causes which are provoking or impacting. However, uh, there is a common solution approach which applies to all of them to keep them and a minimum level of interference. And these are the regulation, the technology, and very importantly, the cooperation among administration and space stakeholders. Having said that, I will not take more time and I would like just to come back to the panel to go to the first of those uh, subjects. And for this, I'm pleased to uh, give the floor to Glenn Feldek, who is International Spectrum Program Manager at NASA Glenn Research Center in Ohio, US. Glenn is also responsible for the coordination notification of satellite networks from NASA and has been the US delegation for, less, for the last six years. Has also participated at the ITUR working party study groups for the past 24 years and is currently the chairman of the ITUR working party 3M and head of the US delegation to the ITUR study group 7. Glenn, if you are uh, ready, you can take the floor and we look forward for the presentation. Okay, good morning, or good day to everybody. I know we have a lot of time zones represented. Uh, let me share my screen. We tried this before. Okay, good. Uh, so good day, everybody. Um, yeah, there's really uh, a few things I'd like to discuss. Uh, NASA certainly has a number of interests in uh, space, obviously, and, and, and communication in space. And we have, uh, we, we do obviously have requirements for uh what you might consider more traditional applications of communication in space. Uh, but we do have uh, within the space sciences, not just NASA, but uh, many space agencies, some kind of special considerations that I wanted to touch on because I think some of the more traditional applications of communication are going to be uh, touched on by other panelists, uh, specifically uh, working in deep space and what that means. Um, some passive remote sensing and how passive remote sensing works, though I believe my colleague Elena is going to go into this in a, a, a lot more detail than I would. And finally, the very exciting area of uh, communication at the moon. Um, and each one is a little bit unique uh, because the, the the location of where we're operating is, is a little different. Some of the mission requirements and, and the ways in which we're sensitive to uh, potential radio frequency interference uh, are are just a little different in how we how we measure it, how we monitor it uh, from the more traditional, uh, just straight near Earth communication type applications. Um, when we talk about deep space communication, uh, the you know the, the definition of what's deep space is actually two million kilometers from Earth. That's in the radio regulations. You're not in deep space till you're two million uh, kilometers from the Earth. Uh, and just to put that in perspective, if you're at the moon, you're nowhere near deep space. Actually, uh, communication with the moon is still going to be in the near-Earth bands, but obviously the distances are so great um, that the receivers have to be extremely sensitive. And we'll be talking a little bit about the moon a little later. Also, it takes quite a while to get to deep space, um, and, and, and there's a number of phases before our deep space missions even get there. Uh, obviously, we start off on Earth, and then there's the launch and the early orbit. Typically, our deep space missions are going to do a few uh, laps around the Earth, do a few orbits while we do some initial checkouts and look at things. Uh, we may do some slingshots, uh, do some essentially elliptical orbits to try to build up speed, use the Earth's gravity to slingshot us off into space, uh, for which there's a cruise phase. We, you know, A number of missions uh, have recently, I believe uh, the U.S., the UAE, I believe China has have all uh, 
uh, in the last uh, few months launched things to Mars. Um, Launching to Mars is always tricky because you want to do it when the uh, when Mars is uh, going to be relatively near the Earth uh, since we're in su- completely different orbits, and we only get that shot well, about once every two and a half years. So if you miss the window, you have to wait two and a half years to do it again. So there's been a, a lot of uh, discussion uh, in the news about missions going to Mars. They all kind of go off at the same time. Um, we have near-Earth flybys, uh, again, when we're trying to build up speed. This is also when we do a lot of course corrections, uh, uh, early mission checkouts. A lot of those are critical ops. Um, and even missions that go off to deep space and return to the Earth. The, the picture you see on the right there is uh, a mission we had called Stardust that went off. It flew through the tail of a comet, picked up uh, particles from the tail of the comet, and then returned them back to the Earth. So even things that we send off to deep space – uh, can come back. In fact, one of the the mission uh, Perseverance ITU filing named Mars 2020 because we didn't know it was going to be called uh, Perseverance when we flew it, uh, when we filed it. I mean, um, is on its way to Mars. It'll be there in a couple of years, and it's it's uh, going to be bottling up. Uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, rock and soil samples that a future mission can go to Mars and then return back to the Earth. Um, and what I like to bring up about this is, you know, we think about protecting uh, missions that are going to deep space uh, from radio infer- uh, interference. And, you know, it's, it's, it's very easy to say, well, yeah, if the thing's on Mars or even further out, um, you know, it's easy to protect, protect them because they're so far away. But there are a lot of uh, considerations of, well, they're allowed to operate in deep space bands, and they're protected while still near the Earth. This is uh, Article uh, 4.24 of the radio regs. Even though they're not 2 million kilometers away from Earth yet, they're they're going to be, the purpose of their mission is to send them out there, um, but they are still uh, subject to or potential interference while they're still close to the Earth. Um, the next one I like to talk about is uh, passive remote sensing. This is something that uh, causes some uh, confusion sometimes, because essentially, you know, everything on the, on the planet, every physical body emits electromagnetic radiation, and our passive sensors uh, detect that. And it, it, depending on what the the object is made out of, or the temperature of it, it's it's determines what the frequency is going to be. So these are things that. Um, we we can't just if we get an interference we can't just switch to another channel. Um, there's a, it, it's mother nature that's determining wh- what the frequency is that these things are going to emit at. And when you're talking about the emissions, these are emissions by molecules. The signals are really really weak. So uh, we're we're kind of locked in when we're trying to uh, do this these monitorings of it could be. Uh, temperature, it could be moisture, it could be chemistry, uh, that uh, we, we, we just can't move around. And uh, emissions into some of these bands are uh, can be can be difficult for us. Uh, it's actually, it, it's great when we get no uh, harmful interference, uh, obviously. Um, and it's almost better for some, uh, in some respects, if we get so much interference that it just blows us off the air, because then we know the data is bad. The, 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 the problem comes with remote sensing when we have just a little bit of interference creep in, because when that happens, we know we, we, we get a signal, uh, or we make a measurement and we go, well, it seems plausible. It could be a real measurement. And then we take this data, and that's what goes into the, the models of things like climate change. Um, we NASA doesn't do weather forecasting, but the, the data does go to the weather forecasters. And when we, you know, it, it's hurricane season. You know, we had Hurricane Sally land uh, just yesterday in, in the United States, causing damage. Um, but it, it, it could happen, you know, anywhere. Um, if, if we get data that's just a little bit off because there's a little bit of interference, but it's not enough that we can actually detect that it's not re- just a real signal. Um, this is bad data that goes into the weather forecasting models. And when we're trying to figure out where is the the, the typhoon going to land or which way is the hurricane going to blow before it makes landfall and where are we going to have to send aid and relief and supplies, um, 
you know, b- bad data just is not good to put into the models. Um, I, I often say, you know, these, these radiometers are essentially like, if you think of a radio astronomy telescope, just take one of those, make the antenna smaller, stick it in space and point it down. It's just a power meter. There's, it's, uh, it's not like if you have interference into a communication channel, all your ones and zeros get garbled and the data coming out the other end of the link makes no sense. It's just a, a pure measurement of how much power do we see in a, in a particular channel. Uh, and then the last item that I wanted to talk about was actually about the moon. The moon is 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 an, a unique challenge. Uh, NASA has committed itself that it's going to send uh, the the first woman and the next man back to the moon here in just a couple of years. Uh, we already have uh, some satellites orbiting the moon, but we're we're going to the moon to stay. And it's not just NASA. There's lots of uh, missions going to the moon, and it, it it's it's an interesting thing when you think about like within on Earth the development of wireless infrastructure and how we uh, develop, how we've developed from, you know, wireless telegraphs up to, you know, IMT and aeronautical and everything else took a, took a good deal of time. Uh, it took time to build the infrastructure. It took a lot of years. We had a chance to kind of figure it out, but the moon is about to get very busy. It's not just uh, NASA going to the moon, uh, the European Space Agency is going to the moon, China is at the moon, uh, there are commercial interests in going to the moon, and so we really need to coordinate our lunar activities. This is going to be very, very important uh, for for the future because if, if we're not all working together, it could be a mess up there. Um, Within the space agencies, we already have a, a, a very good cooperative effort going on, uh, but you know there are going to be commercial interests going there. Uh, there's going to be uh, ju- just uh, there's going to be terrestrial. <laughs> I can't even say terrestrial because Terra means Earth. there are going to be point-to-point links on the surface of the moon, mobile links on the moon links from the moon to the earth, links from the moon to things orbiting the moon, uh, different operators. There's, uh, there's going to be people on the moon. So it's, it's, it becomes a very, very uh, complex uh, issue that we're going to have to uh, uh, really get a, a grip on clo- uh, quickly. Um, the space agencies are, are doing this uh, certainly amongst themselves. Uh, and we're trying to, you know, uh, communicate with uh, other non-civil space agencies that have expressed interest in, in, in doing uh, work on the moon. It could be uh, commercial tourism, could be mining. Uh, there's uh, folks that are talking about doing some mining on the moon. Um, so the, the, it, it's, it's just about, it's going to get very busy up there very quickly over just a few years. And so that, that's, that's a challenge that we're really looking at and to make sure that we, we don't have interference. So uh, with that, I think those are, you know, just from NASA's perspective, uh, some of the some of the interesting challenges that uh, we, we're we're having to deal with right now, and uh, I, I think that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Glenn. It was very very interesting presentation. I'm very excited to know about the the current issues, which may be addressed about the moon as well. Uh, we have five more minutes for for questions. In case uh, we haven't received yet many questions, only a few. But uh, please don't be shy if everybody would like to, to ask some question to, to Glenn. Uh, I have one here, in fact, we, we have received, and it's about, uh, yes, exactly. You were speaking about the moon also, and, and what is your view on possible future allocations to space services around the moon? Uh, in ter- I'm uh, got a little choppy audio. Uh, the question is about allocations for around the moon. Yes, I, I understand that well. Today, uh, as you know well, in the ITUR we have three regions: region one, two, and three, with frequency allocations. And there are some uh, uh, missions that they are going to the moon. Or and there, there were discussions I seen also uh, about if the allocation would be the same than in the in the around the Earth or. There would be a need of a region four, let's say, or how, <laughs> how, how would you see this? It, it's perhaps early to say, but uh, there are some people who are already thinking, and I think the question is addressed to that direction. Yeah, no, that's an excellent question, and it, it, it's it's one we've had to discuss before. It's something we've definitely had to take into account. Um, the 
from an okay from a NASA perspective, uh, we're not seeing too many issues with respect to the, uh, the the table of allocations right now. Uh, the the one somewhat difficult point is that we have, as I, I said, the moon is still near Earth. It's not in deep space, so we would be we NASA would be using um, space research allocations that exist to support the moon. Uh, however, the moon is so far away that we probably would be using those uh, allocations from mostly our deep space network. Uh, there, are, there are, you really need a big antenna to reach the moon for regular operational uh, work. Now, when we start getting into the uh, things like uh, space tourism or mining in space, uh, the, that is gonna lead to uh, operators in the space research bands who haven't been there before. And so that we have to see how congested that spectrum is going to get. And that could lead to us, uh, you know, needing to look at new allocations, uh, perhaps only in the region of the moon. Um, I've heard some talk uh, in the past, people have brought up, should we make the moon a region four, but I'm not so sure personally that that's necessary. Uh, I think that could get real complicated real quickly. Um, now for things like uh, point to point links on the moon, uh, there have been some uh, people talking about, uh, you know, would we just call that, uh, w could we use like IMT bands on the moon and just deploy like a cellular network on the moon? Technologically, yes. But we have to remember that the way the radio regs are set up, you know, the radio regs were set up when, you know, what is it, 110 years ago now, everything was terrestrial. There was never a thought about being uh, in space. And so the radio regs in Article 1 uh, say very clearly, everything in the radio regs is terrestrial unless it specifically says space or satellite in it. it de you default to being in space. So we would need to look at if we were to do something like deploying a cellular network or using you know, traditional fixed and mobile uh, technologies on the moon if we'd have to, uh, because those technologies are defined as being on Earth. Once they're on the moon, they're not on Earth. Uh, so we, we got a, a, an, an issue of definitions that we would need to try to uh, work through. Thank you. Yes, it seems that it's not something easy to do, to resolve today, let's say, it has to go through the full process, I understand. Uh, I think this, your answer is already covering some of the questions. I have one more, very specific. Uh, I mean, there are questions about jurisdiction, about questions about if NASA would take the deal, let the lead, sorry, in building a new legislation regarding the frequency coordination on the moon. Uh, uh, and one particular about what is NASA's concern of interference from 95 gigahertz to 250 gigahertz? Is there a specific frequency of uh, your concern? I, I don't know if you can answer now. It's a very specific uh, question. Perhaps it's better to, to, or you have it in mind. It's, well, it's, uh, 95 to 250 gigahertz? Yeah, exactly. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah, most of what we have up there is going to be the, the passive remote sensing. Um, and uh, we, it's something, you know, there's uh, an agenda item that's uh, coming up. I want to say it's, it's specifically looking at the 231 to 252 gigahertz. Um, when, you know, when, when the frequencies up there were allocated years ago, it, there weren't a lot of known requirements. Uh, the, the table does go up that high. And so uh, we are looking at a couple of ways of, okay, now we, are, we, NASA, and the other space agencies are up there doing passive remote sensing. And quite honestly, we're doing some of it in bands where it's not allocated, but it, we're passive. Nobody's going to get radio interference from us, and nobody else is up there so to interfere with us. So it's been sort of okay. But we see, you know, as the demand for... Uh, uh, spectrum keeps going. People keep moving to higher frequencies. Uh, that uh, we need to perhaps relook at how the allocations are 
uh, made re relook now that we have missions and we have real mission requirements up there uh, to make sure that everyone is 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 properly accommodated. Uh, because I, 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 th I think, you know, years ago when the uh, table of allocations went up to 207, was extended all the way up to 275 gigahertz, there was a lot of guessing going on there. So maybe taking a, a, a new look at it uh, before the, you know, before things get too crowded uh, to actually figure out, you know, relook at what are the, the requirements up there. Okay, Th thank you. Uh, I think for the time being it's okay. If you can stay a little bit more, uh, we will have a, a set of more questions at the end with all the panelists, but uh, we should perhaps move to, to the next panelist. Thank you very much, Glenn. And we'll come back to Thank more you. questions at the end. So now uh, we are pleased to have also Elena Daganza Eusebio from the European Space Agency. Elena is a senior frequency management engineer working for the European Space Agency in their facilities in the Netherlands. Her tasks within the Air Observation Directorate include the participation in the WRC preparatory process to ensure the protection of ESA Air Observation's interest in the utilization of the spectrum. Elena has been deeply involved in increasing awareness of the RFI problem for passive sensors, in particular the ESA SMOS mission. Elena, if you are ready, the floor is yours. So, good day to everybody. I'm Elena Daganzo from the European Space Agency. Thank you very much, Jorge. And thank you also for the opportunity of explaining, presenting here in this forum what is the, the problematic of the interference to passive remote sensors. Uh, remote sensing is one of the few, few systems that, uh, and, and services that they don't interfere to anybody, but they're extremely sensitive. And that is the reason why it's so special. So this is what uh, I am going to, to cover in this presentation, is uh, explaining what is the importance of the passive sensors, what is the, the bands that are used, that as Glenn has explained before, that is, is defined by the, by the mother nature, we cannot uh, change those bands, and which are the key ITU recommendations that are uh, related to this. Then when we come to interference, which are the actions that can be taken? And uh, it's important to have an idea of how big is the problem. And to that uh, fact, the, one of the tools that we have is to see how many RFIs have been reported, or how many missions and in how many bands. Uh, we have then the, the myth of the RFI mitigation. Uh, sort of, we can listen uh, that is where more and more uh, advertisement of what is passive sensors and RFI detection and mitigation. Uh, okay, mitigation can be helpful, but it's not a panacea, it's not idea, it's not gratis to have some, uh, some associated disadvantages. So we need to avoid wrong messages and we will see that also. And then we have uh, for ISA, one of the, uh, our experience in RFI has been uh, sten uh, extensively uh, developed in Elban with the SMOS radiometer. This is a mission that was launched in 2009 and that uh, observed a high number of interference that were not expected. There is a lot of work that has been done since then, and I will present an overview of what is the situation and what, how we learn with that. And we will finish with uh, yes, some conclusions. So uh, the Earth exploration and also the meteorological satellite systems, they use active and passive sensors. And what they use the sensor is essentially to study the Earth and the natural phenomena that are associated. What is unique in the satellites that are used for Earth, Earth observation uh, is the capability to do global measurements over the Earth. It's not just a country, it's not just an area, it's global measurements over the Earth, land, ocean, and atmosphere. But also have the capability with the satellites to focus, to target an area that has been, for example, just uh, damaged with a... Uh, uh, so uh, we say that what is unique is global observation, the capability to target areas that maybe they have a, a natural disaster and we want to focus the observation there. And also the possibility to do monitoring of observation over long periods of time. Uh, what is important is to stress that is key to have the access to the radio spectrum. 
And that is not only for space-based uh, sensors, also for ground uh, sensors, and passive and active. This is important for all the activities for studies of the global warming and climate change, but also there are many, many applications that uh, now we are taking for granted. Data is there. We are used to it. Like, uh, like that is the weather forecast and the prediction of the weather, uh, the support to natural disasters, but we cannot take for, uh, for granted because if we don't have the spectrum, that cannot be done. And finally, to mention that the Earth exploration uh, as a whole brings benefit to the society, not only for the non-profit and space agencies, but also for the commercial sector. Uh, which are the bands that are used? Which are the frequencies? The products, data products we have from the remote sensors, what they are observing is the, the, the atmosphere. And for that, the, the bands to be observed, they are, uh, they are fixed. This cannot be duplicated. Each frequency band is, is good, is used for certain observation. And at the same time, uh, in most cases, we need to use different bands to do the observation uh, of certain parameters. That means that we need to measure the same uh, in different frequency bands. That is like for to resolve parameters like the sea surface, temperature, uh, surface winds, soil moisture, rain, snow. But essentially, what we have here is the, the, the chart with the frequencies and the, uh, the, uh, the absorption in the atmosphere. So we can see the peaks of the oxygen and the water, water vapor. And depending on what uh, the uh, uh, parameter is going to be observed, there are different bands that are, are used. The passive sensor requires very sensitive very low no noise receiver because they are essentially measured noise. And the emissions are about certain very low level, maybe a harmful interference. And this, the, the big difficulty is not only if it is a big interference, it's also that if it is very uh, small, in many cases, the difficulty is to difference, dif make the difference, to differentiate the wanted signal from the interference. Uh, here we have some of the uh, ITU recommendations that can be uh, that are very useful related with uh, passive remote sensing, and we have the performance and interference criteria, the identification of which bands are useful, technical characteristics and operational characteristics of these sensors. This is the characteristics used for the certain uh, and compatibility analysis in the WRC process. And also there is in the report uh, 2165, there is some analysis about the mitigation, different mitigation techniques. Uh, let's see about frequency bands that uh, we can use. Uh, we're going to make here two main groups. One is what is the purely passive bands. These are bands that with the ITU footnote 5340, no emissions are allowed in the band. The all, all man-made emissions are prohibited. And uh, for this uh, for this purpose, in resolution 750, he said the restriction to the unwanted emission of the adjacent bands, because essentially that is impossible to 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 avoid. If you have a, a active services in the adjacent band while we do have unwanted emissions. So there are some restrictions to the level of the unwanted emissions in the resolution 750, very important for passive sensing. And in Europe, uh, there are in some bands that Europe at uh, a regional level has taken the, the step forward to make mandatory uh, the, the levels, the rescission of the, of the levels of unwanted emissions uh, that in the resolution 750 in some cases are only recommended. Uh, of the bands that we have, uh, it's worth to mention the L band 1.4 gigahertz that is used by SMOS, uh, ISA mission, SMAP, and Aquarius, NASA, and that uh, both all these missions they have experienced, they have detected a lot of interference. And with SMOS, ISA has gained a lot of experience about the process of location of the RFI, characterization, identifying the, the sources, and interfacing with the national regulatory authorities. 
uh, to ensure that there are some investigations and that we are improving the situation. Then also in Tejida Hertz, that there are, uh, is a band that is very important. We don't have in ISA any mission at this moment, uh, but will come soon with the CIMAR mission, that is a new Copernicus mission. And in this band, there are multiple RFI cases that have been reported and that you can see in different publications. Here is just a snapshot what is the resolution 750 that I just mentioned. So here we have, there are two tables in the resolution, table one and two. Table one, they establish what is the limits for the unwanted emission limits, that they are mandatory limits. In this specific snapshot, I have selected for the uh, L band 1.4, gigahertz and also in the 24 gigahertz. And we can see here the mandatory limits that are imposed for IMT and also for intersatellite uh, links. Uh, and this is the unwanted emissions of these active services into the passive band. And uh, then the other part in the right, the table two, these are, unfortunately, they are only recommended, even though for many administration recommended uh, levels in the resolution 750, they are implemented as mandatory. Uh, what we have here now is the other family of passive bands. These are bands that are not purely passive. That means that the emissions are not prohibited in, in the band, but they are shared with other services. These, uh, the, these bands are typically shared with a terrestrial fixed and mobile service and also with downlinks of Leo and Geo. FSS links. And uh, uh, to this uh, purpose, the ITU regulation have set the condition for sharing the band. And in case that there is harmful interference, we have the possibility, the same that we had in the previous case for the purely passive, of reporting the interference. Uh, the interference protection for all the bands is, the, is in the recommendation RS 2017. The characterization of the RFIs is always important, the same that is the characterization of the sensor. And uh, when uh, ESS passive can claim protection because it's operating in the band and has all the characteristics that are okay for that. In that case, then the next step is to move to the reporting of the harmful interference. Uh, typically, the, the big problem that we normally have is sometimes not so much the in-band, but the adjacent bands. And when we are talking about radar system in adjacent bands, the problem of the excessive and wanted emissions is something that for passive sensors is a quite common problem. Uh, looking to the left, we see here a few bands that are worth to mention. In the 10 gigahertz, there are multiple cases of RFI reported, something similar for the 18 gigahertz, and uh, identical for the 36, 37 gigahertz. In this case, for example, uh, ISA has identified for the Sentinel-3 radiometer a uh, massive interference due to almost blinding the instrument due to radar emissions. So it's something that is very, very difficult to handle in many cases because the truth is that the, the passive sensors are extremely sensitive. So which actions can be taken? We can take preventive actions, that is what we have in the radio regulations, that is we have recommendation report, we have resolution, we have restrictions of the unwanted emissions, we have pro pro eh, prohibited the emissions in the band, that is the prevention. But when there is the prevention is not working, we have to go to the, the corrective part, that is the capability to report the harmful interference to the administrations and what we do uh, typically, uh, especially in the last year with the experience that ISA has got with SMOS, we are also keeping the, the Bureau of ITU for information. That is also useful to have some sort of statistics about what is the, the situation. Uh, we have the Article 15 and Appendix 10 that is covering the part of harmful, harmful interference and the, the the type of support and the type of regulatory framework in the radio regulations that have been introduced by Jorge before. And also we have an online system in ITU that facilitates the process to report this, uh, these RFIs. In the case of the passive sensors, it's very different to the case of interference between two radio links, for example, of two satellites that they have broadcasting systems. In this case, what we could see is that the 
the information that Appendix 10 was asking to provide to the operator of the potentially interfering uh, service, uh, that, info that uh, set of information was not tailored for the passive sensors. Because of that, uh, within the uh, study group uh, seven, in seven, group 7C, was developed this recommendation that we have here, the RS2106, that uh, is given essentially what is the template and what is the, the approach to follow in the detection and in the resolution of the RF5 for passive sensors. It's giving us what is the template that uh, need to be provided to the administration so that we facilitate the, the, the investigation of what is the source of the RF5. Uh, this table, I think that is quite interesting because essentially what we see here is the different, for the different bands, purely passive or what it, when it's shared, what is the, what can we do depending on type of interference we are, we are uh, having. I am going to pass quickly because uh, time is, is going fast. The sizing of the RFI problem is important and it's important uh, for RFI passive sensors because there is an increasing market demand of mass market uh, devices that they have more and more spectral needs. And there is also a push for the regulation of the commercial market with unlicensed devices. And in that situation, the, the sensors, they are, they are receiving the aggregate impact of a high, high number of small interference. In that situation, it's extremely difficult to, to get any changes, to have any, any fix, any easy fix, because that has a lot of uh, implications. And that is why it's so important to set since the very beginning, which are the regulatory environment for the use of that specific band. Uh, we see in passive sensing an important increase of the RFIs. And unfortunately, it's not so easy to, to know about all the bands, what is going on. And that one of the reasons is that only recently we have in ATU this SIR system that is extremely useful because it's a way to re record internationally the RFIs. And that has a way also to increase the awareness of what is the RFI uh, problem. Another issue is that typically uh, not all the operators of passive sensors are regularly reporting the, the RFI events. And uh, that is unfortunately something that hopefully will change when uh, it's perceived that this is doable and you can get a benefit. And finally, to mention that there is not enough awareness uh, about the procedures that, that some agencies or operators need to follow in case of uh, RFIs to sensors. If with the mitigation of the RFIs, we need to uh, avoid wrong messages, mainly because there is always some quality degradation of the data, uh, and that is in many cases not specified in the papers, in the scientific paper that uh, we can see. And uh, it's extremely important for the RFI uh, combat, let's say, what is the detection uh, and the characterization of the RFIs when it's something that is punctual, that is very well located RFI. In that case, it's easy to locate and to take actions for the elimination. But if it is an aggregate in, uh, interference over a big area, that is more difficult. And as I said before, when it's a mass market equipment, in that case, it's extremely difficult. What is even more uh, problematic for passive sensors is those RFIs that are so close to the, the noise floor that become om almost unnoticeable, unnoticeable till the number is so big that then it's too late. Uh, I would like just to show you some slides about what we have seen with the radiometer of SMOS in 1.4 gigahertz. This is what was uh, the RFI quality map in 2010, that is 10 years ago, when the satellite was launched. You can see here that the areas that are in red, they are areas that uh, in all the passes could be uh, detected interference. And that was January. Mainly the RFIs are focused, are concentrated in Europe, Middle East, and South and East Asia. 
here it's very interesting because what has been done is to do the, the, the probability of RFIs but during the whole period for 2010 and 2019. And you can see here all those areas that in a moment or another, they are experiencing, uh, experiencing uh, RFI. So that means that certainly in these areas, there is no possibility to do a long-term monitoring of the parameters that uh, SMOS is uh, observing. From global statistics, we have like 500, almost 500 RFIs, and uh, we have very strong RFIs that is like 60 worldwide, and, uh, but small RFIs below uh, 1,000 Kelvin. Uh, we have like close to 275 worldwide. In Asia, they are concentrated the highest number of interference, and the strongest are Asia and Middle East, with some of them also in Europe. A reporting process. We have reported to all the ISA member states, some European, no, that other European countries that are not ISA members, and outside Europe. Altogether, 52 countries. RFIs, what is the interference that has been detected? CCTV cameras, unauthorized radio link, TV repeaters, deck uh, mobile phones, and uh, also IF circuits of 12 gigahertz uh, receiving uh, satellite signals. And all of these are in bands, in a band that all emissions are prohibited. And then for the out of band, the main uh, RFI source detected have been radars. Here you can see over the, the time, what is the evolution? You, you can see, for example, the strong RFIs that there are some uh, going down with all the reporting efforts, but certainly that there are a lot of areas still that they have uh, interference. This is an example about the amount of data that has to be discarded. The percentage of data has to be uh, just uh, put aside because it's polluted. And that, in this case, this is the case of interference over the area of Japan due to the, uh, the radiation of the receiving equipment of the broadcasting system in KU1, but the, the radiation is happening in the inter intermediate frequency, that is in 1.4. We go now to the conclusions, and is that for the for the ISS passive sensors, the solution of the problem is mainly the prevention. Oh, sorry. This, a ver. The solution is the prevention, because that is the importance of having the, the, the relevant limits. It's very important the protection of the passive bands. The case of the illegal uh, emissions, that can be uh, something that can be handled because uh, with the cooperation of international authorities is something that can be reported and improved. However, the, for the case of excessive and wanted emission, that is something that is, is being more complicated and is especially also difficult when it's uh, RFI due to aggregate of many, many RFIs. And uh, we need to continue the efforts, working together, the scientific community, and also ITU and the administrations. And with this, thank you very much. I'm sorry for being a bit longer than expected, but this is my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Lena. We, it was a bit longer, but certainly the, the information you provided, in particular technical information, I think is very useful. And, uh, just to move forward uh, to the next uh, speaker, before that, perhaps just one or two questions we have received, and then again, we will catch up at the end of the... I'm sorry, my microphone, did you hear? Yeah. Yeah, no, I was saying th thanks for, for uh, the presentation, which was indeed very, very fruitful, and with a lot of substance, technical substance. Uh, just before to move forward to the next speaker, perhaps uh, as we did before, one or two questions, and then we will we'll catch up with more questions at the panel. Um, once from the VR, we cannot <laughs> avoid because you really have uh, done a lot of efforts for uh, for reporting. I think um, ISA is one of our main contributors to the to the series uh, in terms of reports. So. We would like to know your experience in terms of uh, the use of IT systems and if you see that there would be one possibility for improvements also. 
Thank you, Jorge. I, I think that the seed is, is a very good tool. And it's very good because it's useful to keep the stability, not only of the reports, also of the evolution of the different reports. And uh, I think that for the case of the sensors, it uh, could be quite useful to have a sort of summary of what is the, the, the bands and the reporting that has been done. Because so far, we at least for ISA, we are keeping not public the, 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 the reports mm -hmm. that we have. But that is something that is something that can be can be changed. But I believe that since we are with SIRS, I can tell you that we have also noticed an improvement in the responses from the administrations. Gives more visibility and really from ISA we are really very thankful for this initiative. Okay, well th thank you for your feedback and uh, more importantly for using it. And we have a couple of, of improvements to do still, and we have passed it to, to our software developers. Now when we are free from, from the WRC-19 implementation, they will improve it even more. But we hope that more and more administration are, are using it as well. Um, one more question, perhaps we will take it later in order not to be more delayed, yes, during the panel. And uh, thanks again for the presentation. And, and uh, we would like to move now from the... LEO orbit that we were mainly with the exploration satellite service to a GSO orbit. In this case, Etan Lavan from Director of Orbital Resources at UTELSAT uh, will give us uh, some, some words or some messages. Uh, Etan uh, is working at UTELSAT since 2010 and prior, prior to joining UTELSAT, Etan was responsible for the regulatory policy and management of service and spectrum licenses at the global level for IMARS and global the UK-based mobile satellite services operator, for which he joined in 2002. From 1989 to 2001, he held various responsibilities at Alcatel Space Industries, including regulatory standards coordination for the SkyBridge broadband satellite program. Etam? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for, um, for introducing me, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk to you also, obviously, about interference. I have a feeling that I'm coming down first from deep space, then down to the moon, then to the, the, the planet Earth as a whole, and now maybe into your maybe into your living rooms and offices. But uh, I'm going to talk about interference in a more practical standpoint for services provided by the GSO uh, satellite systems, uh, for which um, uh, UTELSAT has been invited, and I'm very pleased to to give you our our perspective. So thank you all again. Uh, just just to begin, uh, I'd like to say that. Um, Probably useful to look at the categories of interference that a GSO operator will experience. Uh, we have uh, most of the interference that we receive is simply errors. It's simply errors in planning of emissions. It could be error, technical errors in, in, in setting up links, or equipment could be could be faulty. We also have uh, so that's really the majority. There's also uh, adjacent satellite interference, which can fall into some of those categories uh, from other satellite operators. And, and that involves, of course, discussing amongst ourselves and our coordination agreements. There are going to be interference from services which are using uh, shared uh, bands or, or, or in adjacent bands. I'll speak about that a little bit later as well. But what I'll probably focus on, uh, it's always a favorite subject in this, in this, this uh, 10 or 15 minutes that I have, would be what I would what we often call intentional interference. Now it's it's low incidence, fortunately, for satellite operators, but it is the most difficult to uh, to to approach and uh, to solve, and it has the highest consequences, as you'll see. Uh, just as an aside, there's another kind of interference, if you could, would call it that. It's called pirate transmissions. Uh, I'll put that in a separate category, although it, it's intentional. Uh, it's, it's usually, I would say, somewhat of a commercial issue where uh, an operator or, or a group is trying to uh, use, uh, illicitly use satellite capacity to convey their, their material and their messages or their information. But they normally try to coexist with the existing services. In fact, not to try, they try not to cause harmful interference to real services because their objective is to stay online as possible. But I, I just wanted to mention that. So what do we do? as a GSO operator on a day-to-day -day basis? What, what are our, our tools, what are our mechanisms? Well, many of you may know already, there's a, there's a cooperations for the types of interference, which is uh, between operators, it's called the satellite. There's an organization called the Satellite Data Association, 
it exchanges information, shares information, which is which is key to being able to quickly resolve uh, amongst operators the most common uh, causes of interference, which is non-intentional and, and accidental. There's also training which goes on, and we support that. Uh, the Global VSAT Forum has a has a a, a large, uh, a widespread training program for for satellite operators, satellite people who are who are interested and in, in need to set up satellite equipment, and that will that goes towards eliminating another very large source of, of unintentional interference, which is a simple error. And all of this, of course, anytime there is interference which doesn't get immediately resolved by the by the first phone call, we have a more operator to operator discussions. We will have um, uh, administration discussions in some cases, if it's, if it's uh, depending on the nature of the, of the service that we're observing. And, uh, and we will, in parallel, and I'll talk about also that in a couple of minutes, where we have uh, the, the basic technical responses and mitigation to deal with, with interference, which we, which we use. So uh, just, we saw some diagrams, very useful diagrams from from uh, from Jorge, and, and I, I thank him because he gave a lot of the background for some of the scenarios. Uh, so I don't have to repeat them again as how satellite uh, works and how interference works. But I think it's still useful to highlight uh, the a very big difference between interference on the downlink and interference on the on the uplink. So obviously, a satellite uh, uh, typically you provide inf information from the ground up to the satellite, and it's either reflected or processed, and it comes down. And different, uh, uh, sometimes different uh, beam coverages uh, to to the receiving terminals on the ground. Now, if you have interference on the downlink, it's localized interference, on, and it's it's basically terrestrial in a way, terrestrial through terrestrial interference between the terrestrial interferer and the um, and the uh, receiving earth station, in, in, if it's in the case of uh, of intentional interference, of course, uh, you can have downlink interference in adjacent satellite under any conditions. I should, I should be clear about that. Uh, but it doesn't, so, so it, it only affects locally. Uplink interference, on the other hand, the uplink, which in going up to the satellite is itself degraded. And so the satellite cannot provide information or, or, or services to any of the of the stations in the entire downlink beam. So it's much more serious. It's also the type of interference of the two, which is by definition cross-border in nature. And so it more directly, it's also the interference which more directly implicates the IQ process. So probably talking more about, about that and when we get to the specifics in just a second. Um, and before I before I go on to the uh, to the to the to, to speak a little bit more on, on, on the specific problem, which I mentioned on the intentional, uh, just a quick word on, on internet, uh, interference to, to sharing of frequencies with other services. A lot of people have spoken about that. It's clearly an important subject. There's many many new services being introduced. <clears throat> I will say, excuse me, I will say that satellite uh, FSS geostation operators have been dealing with sharing and the need to take care of possible interference from terrestrial services, such as especially fixed services for years. Oftentimes it's just a pragmatic approach you can change frequencies of, of one or the other uh, service. You can sometimes even just move an antenna to the other side of the building if it's a satellite receiving antenna or, or, uh, or otherwise. Um, but we also have to look at the new services and, and we're sp speaking a lot about uh, the sharing studies, the introduction, identifying a lot of new terrestrial services in IMT, which, which are going to, uh, which the sharing conditions, the co coexisting conditions are, are being deeply studied. And, and that, that is such a vast subject, and it's, it's of course, it'll be extremely important to us, but I didn't think that it was uh, uh, it was a, a part of this, um, I don't intend to make that part of this presentation. I think those of you who are in the WRC process, uh, you know what this is about, and, and I would say that that's for another seminar. Um, so intentional interference, a few, a few definitions, just to be clear, what we're talking about is, again, very different from accidental or, or unintentional or consequential uh, interference consequential to, to just the operations which, uh, which another service is trying to do in a normal way. We can characterize it, and, and this has been discussed for over uh, many, many, um, many different symposia. So we, so we can make a few conclusions. It's often of a high power. Uh, very often an unmodulated uh, signal or a signal with no ID or no, no information, whether, whether it is modulated or not. A lot of times we'll see that it's uh, highly directed towards a specific target, a specific target being a satellite receiver for the uplink, which makes it unlikely that it's, uh, that it's by accident. 
uh, it often targets specific content and program in the case of, of trying to uh, uh, stop certain types of objectionable information which is objectionable to, to some parties from being uh, widely distributed. And so it's also uh, uh, time, uh, certain times of the day. And probably the most uh, the most telling of all is that a lot of times you'll see when we're dealing with uh, unintentional, I mean, sorry, intentional interference, is that it will track the mitigation uh, efforts that the operator is trying to um, trying to put into place. So if we switch channels, they switch channels. The interfering signal switches channels, frequencies. Uh, if we increase power, uh, they they might increase power also, and so on and so on. So. Another thing, uh, we talk about cooperation, about the, the working with the IQ. It's not a given that the player involved, uh, and this is probably an understatement, I should say, uh, uh, in, in, in generating unintentional uh, intentional interference is going to cooperate. They might not even be uh, possible to, to find, to engage in, in, in dialogue. So, of course, it's, this is the IQ, and we know that in the radio regulations, administrations are those technically responsible. Uh, for transmissions which are admitting from their uh, from their territories uh, and hence uh, responsible in, in a way for the interference that they cause. But even with the best of will of the administrations, the actual the actual situation um, on, on, on the ground it doesn't make it so obvious in, in practice as, as we can all imagine. So what do we do when we have a case of, uh, of, of such a problematic intentional interference? The first thing is we have to identify where the interference is coming from. And we've had entire uh, entire seminars and uh, and, and uh, technical developments are ongoing on geolocalization. It's using uh, adjacent satellites. It's using your own satellite. It's using equipment on board a satellite, uh, reference ground stations. There's many different techniques where you can pinpoint to a fairly close. Uh, well, I shouldn't say pinpoint. You can identify to a very close uh, um, uh, approximation as to where the emitting station uh, is is located. Uh, and that allows you to reach out to administration uh, to 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 see uh, if there if there's you know what what can be done what what's uh, what's what's possible cooperations between them. Uh, again, I mentioned that we adapt we adapt our own transmissions in the meantime with uh, with the, with the customers who are affected or the users who are affected with in terms of uh, of uh, power. We can increase the power and decrease the sensitivity of the satellite to a certain point, change channels and so on. But if we don't find a solution, despite the best will between the operators and administrations, then we do engage the IQ process, uh, uh, which of course always uh, uh, relies on goodwill and the good intentions to respect the treaty. Now, uh, Jorge mentioned some of the, uh, in, in the scheme of actions in the case of harmful interference, uh, the, the two top bullets or whatever, or, or bubbles in his, his, his graph, this enforcement, uh, this, the, the, the uh, diplomatic channels, multilateral treaties, compulsory arbitration, it never happens. We, we know that. It's, uh, that's not the solution, and then that's, not, uh, that's, that's not the way it, uh, it works uh, in, 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 in this process. But we do have the, um, the goodwill and the good intentions for everyone to respect the treaty, which works. Uh, we have the, the database, which is available, as, as Elena has just mentioned, in the, in the CIRS, uh, where, where many, many of the, um, uh, each, each interference report, which is, is, uh, is, um, is, is eligible to be put up for public, uh, public uh, information if, 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 the, uh, if the reporter so desires. And then there's the RRB to, to try and foster even uh, uh, more solutions between, between, the, um, between the, uh, the players. So what we found in, in, in adapting and, and implementing that process is that what really works is raising awareness. A lot of times, uh, uh, people people could be as simple as as the the, the parties, whoever they might be, the, the hostile parties, uh, don't realize that they're easy to be spotted. That that helps right away when that when that's no longer the case. Um, there's a lot of stakeholders which are honestly uh, engaged and committed to cooperating to find uh, to find uh, solutions and to stop this from happening. Uh, the other thing is that. Um, uh, we found that that in line with the uh, with with what we were saying about geolocation and so on, in cooperation amongst the administrations 
uh, for for certified facilities, and this is under the under the, the you mentioned the Hohe as well. There's now eight eight uh, administrations with centers across the, all of the regions ex, uh, of the world that give global global ability to have sort of an ITU uh, supervised uh, geolocation within the within the uh, the the, um, the satellite memorandum of, of cooperation. That's very important to to give credibility for for uh, for the for the data which which is being used as a basis of initiating dialogue. Uh, in the European countries, we had uh, also a, a, an MOU that was more for within within the CPT for financially supporting our station, uh, which is the accredited station in, in Liham, uh, Germany. So so that's a very successful uh, and high high uh, high standard site for for this kind of geolocation. Uh, we're, we're, again, geolocation is being Im improved every day with the techniques and it's even being put on board satellites uh, so that uh, they can actually um, um, increase even further the, 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 the accuracy and, and, and the, 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 um, the detail of the information. Um, we uh, again, I can't, I can't say over and over again. I know it sounds like I'm repeating, but in the end, we're always still relying on the goodwill of the administrations, as part of the being part of the ITR membership and wanting to stay so. And uh, and everyone in that sense, governments, operators, we all have a common goal to to keep the telecommunications going uh, and to to respect the treaty. So so just to, to conclude my brief, well, I hope a brief introduction. Um, uh, looking a bit at the history and moving for, and, and the future at the same time, uh, operators and, 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 and as have been evidenced by numerous uh, symposiums that we had over, over the past uh, 10 years, uh, we have experienced incidences and we have resolved incidents. Uh, we have seen waves of intentional interference happening in the past and, and we will probably see so uh, and we need to be prepared for that in the present and future. But there is no one single answer uh, there's no one solution. What we need is a, a, a common understanding of the issues and a, a sharing of the known paths to the solution. And in this way, we can we can continue to to succeed. Uh, um, I think that last time we really spoke about this at a Planet Potentiary Conference was in 2014, where the the database and the Sierra system was had has its genesis. Maybe, maybe, um, maybe, within, in view of the progress and in view of what we know now, uh, maybe it would be a, a, a subject to to just revisit uh, at the next Planet Potentiary in 2022. Um, I think that um, the subject is important, obviously, and we will continue to work uh, the satellite community as a whole uh, with the governments to solve this problem in a cooperation in a cooperative way. And, uh, and of course, not certain, not simply blindly referring to um, to the related articles in the radio regulation, but but uh, but with the with the open open discussion and awareness. So so that's really what I wanted to say for an introduction. So I, I thank everyone for their attention, and and I believe there may be a few few minutes for questions now or, or at the end. Up to you, Jorge. Thank you. Thank you, Ethan, for, for sharing your experience uh, in this delicate issue of interference to GSO as well. And uh, you mentioned about uh, geolocation, uh, but before to go geolocation, I, uh, you already explained some mitigation techniques that uh, you are already putting in place. And I guess there are also other techniques that you cannot share because it's a way to protect your systems which are operating. But uh, if you speak about the geolocation, uh, is there any danger that applying geolocation or geolocalization, which today is even more and more precise, but sometimes it's not 100 precise, and, and this uh, ellipse could introduce to another country of sovereignty of administrations? Um, yeah, it, it's an interesting question. Um, I guess I guess it's always very, very sensitive when you talk about, uh, in, in a way, geolocation is, is sort of saying, okay, you're naming it. You're naming an administration uh, and and holding them responsible, and it is a very sensitive subject. But re remember, well, first of all, when you do geolocation, you you have a very precise uh, set of of uh, a range. So you, you you can say the, um, the an area of which you are certain that it's within a certain area. Right? It's usually an ellipse, uh, and, and and you have a, you have a, a certainty that it's in with that near certainty that it's within that ellipse. The ellipse could could be close enough to a border or 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 near a border. That it may not be 100% absolutely certain which administration is responsible. 
as an operator or or as as setting as as a, we of course will take that into account with any response that's made. You will say you this is we'll send it to two administrations or three administrations depending if the ellipse is really in a, in a, in, a, in a, a conjunction of, of more of more countries. But uh, but it, it's it, it's it's important to do that. I mean, in the IQ radio regulations, if you're talking about looking for uh, a resolution for for a transmission, uh, we're obliged to find uh, the responsible administration. It's in the radio regulations. You, you can't just, you can't do it any other way. So, so I think, I think, uh, you know, work with us, the cooperation with the ITU, with the credited and, 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 and uh, stations, which, which are, which are run by the administrations under the guidance, under the, under the supervision of the ITU or, or whatever you want to call it, are very important in, in that way. But, but yes, I think I appreciate the, the sensitivity but but we'd still need to we'd need to um, within within respecting all of the all of the all of the obligations and all of all of the rights of every administration we still need to uh, we still need to communicate where the, the stations are likely to be uh, emitting from. No, no, it, it was just a question about accuracy, but certainly we we do need this information because this is the way we can address uh, our communications to the mm -hmm. uh, administration. So th thanks again, and we will try to. We are already at at the end of the initially yeah, end yeah. of the seminar. We have extended, but we have one more interesting presentation in another uh, service, and then we will we'll go to to the Q and A panel at the end. So in this case. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Gerard Bertz, who is working for Eurocontrol. And Gerard Bertz has studied electrical engineering with a focus on navigation system at Embry Radial Aeronautical University and Ohio University. His work experience includes the US Naval Air Systems Command and SkyGuide, the air navigation space provider of Switzerland. 14 years working at Eurocontrol, as I said, he leads and contributes to a variety of aviation working groups on navigation and spectrum matters. And we move, as we said, to radio navigation satellite services. Gerard? Okay, thank you for that kind introduction. So I'll try to be quick about it, but still introduce you to the domain of uh, aeronautical use of uh, space systems. So our systems are split up into navigation, communication, and surveillance systems where navigation is there to guide the pilot and then communication and surveillance is used for an air traffic controller to talk to not only one pilot, but several pilots and keep air, aircraft uh, safely separated. Uh, this is the universe of the uh, air navigation services where CNS plays one part. I like here that is highlighted also that we have search and rescue and meteorological services, which are very important in aviation. So uh, there too, satellites play an interesting role. Um, so without CNS, there's no air traffic management. And of course that all requires spectrum. It's a responsibility under um, the Chicago Convention for of the International Civil Aviation or organization. Uh, that said, uh, there are quite a lot of pressures on aviation. Um, first one being safety and security. And I put these in parentheses because they're not really pressures in that sense. Uh, as you see now uh, with the COVID crisis, if, if passengers don't feel safe, if they are afraid to get sick or such, they don't fly. And that has brought a very unprecedented, uh, especially in terms of its magnitude, crisis on aviation, but cost pressures have always been alive. And if you see what the industry has achieved and being able to fly passengers from A to B at a very reasonable price, make that available for most citizens of this earth uh, to actually exchange and visit. Uh, it's quite an accomplishment, but of course, it's also an intense pressure. Uh, lately has also come the added pressure of the environment. Um, and so I put spectrum at the end with a question mark because um, certainly right now, um, an airline CEO, he's not worrying about spectrum. What we do worry about is being able to fly uh, safely and efficiently primarily. Uh, and that's where satellites actually play quite an, an enormous role. Um, for those of you that have good eyes, spot here the little red dot, which is not perfectly the scale, but that is roughly the coverage of a, of a terrestrial high power en route station. You compare that to a footprint 
equivalent of a geostationary or geosynchronous satellite. It's, of course, uh, no competition whatsoever. So we've embraced global calm nav and surveillance where SATCOM uh, provides transoceanic remote area connectivity. Uh, pilots are no longer using HF single sideband, but actually can talk uh, and, and communicate with data to air traffic control for, for transoceanic and remote crossings. Uh, in navigation, GNSS, uh, global navigation satellites, uh, have supported performance-based navigation that are not no longer tied to where nav aids are located on the ground. Uh, it has enabled free routes. And global surveillance is also uh, starting up an emerging uh, global flight tracking is this one initiative that after uh, some accidents that have made the news in recent years where aircraft were lost at seas. Um, well, they said, let's, let's please no longer use an aircraft. And that's where global surveillance uh, also plays a great role. Now, to do all of that, the tricky thing is that we normally share these systems. They're not aviation-specific system, where all the terrestrial aviation systems are built specifically for aviation, and they have fairly demanding requirements in terms of uh, a CNS uh, system design to not contribute in any relevant fashion to the high-level uh, target level of safety. An interesting example where we are active as your control, where one of our main activities is air traffic flow management, is the network management function where now with space-based ADSB, where ADSB broadcasts the GPS position uh, to air traffic control centers, such that air traffic control centers can see where everybody is, is that we have Europe plus a one-hour horizon and then plus a six-hour ring. And with that, we see what traffic is coming into the network. And what the network manager does is to balance sector loads. So an air traffic controller can control only a given number of aircraft. If all of a sudden he has too many aircraft to deal with, he sends them into a holding loop, uh, turning circles. And that is, of course, not an efficient way of using resources. So your control depends very much on having an accurate picture of, of traffic coming into the European network. And of course, other regions of the world are, are going that way as well. It's also a very powerful tool for post-operations analysis to see what was efficient, what did work well, or how can we do things better. So in terms of optimization of, of the network flows of traffic, uh, these are really fantastic tools. Um, to focus now on the more navigation application side of things, when we say GNSS, what we mean is a core constellation, which is either GPS, GLONASS, Galileo, or Beidou, combined with an augmentation, which is either aircraft space or ground based. And these are designed specifically to meet uh, aviation requirements for a particular phase of flight. Uh, the United States and the Russian Federation have offered GPS and GLONASS respectively uh, to ICAO in letters of commitment, and that sparked the development of ICAO standards and recommendation pra recommended practices that then were published in 2001 for the first time, including GNSS, and by now pretty much all aircraft, uh, with only very few exceptions, are equipped with at least one typically a GPS L1 frequency uh, receiver using aircraft-based integrity algorithms to meet aviation requirements. We're very busy at the ICAO NAV systems panel to include Galileo on Beidou and update uh, new signals on GPS and GLONASS expanding to the L5 frequency. And that, of course, is operating under the RNSS allocation, as you're all well familiar with. An interesting thing is also that actually industry manufacturers are putting GNSS in the many different things that it's becoming difficult to know uh, what exactly can go wrong if GNSS is being interfered with. Um, so what about vulnerabilities? This has been a longstanding concern in the aviation industry. We have designed the augmentation service designs to cater for system uh, malfunctions. We have developed models for multipath, ionosphere, troposphere to correct them and to filter them. So they're pretty okay. With radio frequency interference, that remains the most significant vulnerability, which is simply limited to the physics 
uh, of space-based systems, as people in this audience well know. So because of this vulnerability, we have launched the development of a radio frequency interference mitigation plan that is published in an IKEA document, 9849. It's pretty much a three-step process where first we monitor threats. Uh, once we understand the threats, we assess the risk, we figure out how big a deal it is. And if we say, oh, something needs to be done, we put up mitigation barriers. Uh, and that all gets integrated in our safety management systems. Um, what kind of mi mitigation barriers can we put up? So first of all, we would like the interference not to happen in the first place. So that is outreach and IT regulation that plays the biggest role here. Once it does happen, uh, we wish, of course, it to not affect our operation. So there's onboard avionics capabilities that can sometimes prevent that navigation service is lost. And finally, if it is lost, uh, we want to limit the severity of impact. Um, for that, we need, of course, also observability from threat monitoring networks. Uh, and another way of calling these barriers that has been used by the one of the fathers of, of, of Chief GPS, Brad Parkinson, is to protect, toughen, and augment. So those are sort of the three main angles of attack, main areas of attack that we have to try and limit the vulnerability to interference. Now, the first step being visibility, we started asking pilots. What you need to realize about pilots is that they report outages. They do not report interferences. Sometimes they may speculate that it is interference, but um, it is, uh, strictly speaking, just an outage. And then we do an additional analysis to actually see whether it is most likely interference. And that has been confirmed, unfortunately. And you see in the last two years, we got up to an average of about 10 GPS reports daily from, from the cockpit. So this is something that has a known operational impact. Um, this has, has gone down now, of course, uh, but we also know that some locations keep getting reports. Here you see a bit what is being seen in the cockpit, where you see this is really, you don't want a pilot with having lots of people in the back of his aircraft having to deal with this, for example, a terrain warning where, okay, the pilot is clever enough, he knows where he is, and he doesn't follow it because he knows it's a malfunction. But normally we teach pilots to trust their systems and to strictly follow uh, what a safety system uh, tells them. So these are things that we've had to learn to deal with and that are uh, putting new operational principles that haven't been around. When you look at where these things are, one of the things that is surprising is that a lot of them are en route. In our hotspots are the Middle East uh, to Europe routes across the Black Caspian, Caspian Sea. It's the routes that go via the Mediterranean Sea, Cyprus airspace, Malta, but also flights from Canada and US to the Middle East via cross-polar routes. There's some also in Western Europe. Uh, and so I want to just show you on the example of Cyprus, with whom we have a good cooperation, uh, what these events actually look like. Uh, we did have a flight conducted by DLR, the German Aerospace Research Center. They have an experimental antenna on their research aircraft. This is an Airbus A320, which is many of you are familiar with from going to ITU meetings uh, for sure. Uh, the track on the left is what they've flown. The track on the light, right shows when GPS was available. And this, of course, a very fundamentally different picture. And multiple GPS-related alerts were seen in the cockpit. So this is not something that you would call a, a, J, a stable RNSS service, unfortunately. Um, interestingly enough, uh, the hotspots that we see in our data are also seen by the maritime industry. Uh, so this is from uh, Catherine Dunn, Fortune magazine, and pretty much the hotspots that you see here. Uh, the sensitivity of this that has just been talked about, uh, yes, there are sensitive hotspots. But still, you have, for example, a report that I got from the U.S. Uh, GPS user support where a ship going from Cyprus in the Beirut, uh, not, no GPS signal, signal available, not even once. So that is not something that is very good operationally. So we start operational analysis because of that. Uh, we look at the traffic and, of course, from 
ADSB reporting, we get the tracks. From those, we pick out those that actually have gaps. And so those where GPS was interrupted, so here you see the gaps of GPS on these tracks. Uh, this helps us to, uh, to do two things. Um, the first priority is to manage operational impact such that air traffic control knows which aircraft might actually need help in navigating. Um, it also, of course, looking at multiple aircraft means that we know that multiple aircraft have a problem. So that pretty much excludes the possibility of an individual avionics uh, aircraft fault. So we know it must be an external problem that is most likely interference. The second one that has been mentioned also in this webinar, um, where a number of measurements have identified um, a hotspot over Syria, which is understandable as a zone of conflict. Uh, but this geolocation map that uses the power difference of arrival approach is identifying the locations of uh, probable um, interference source locations. Uh, this has a heat map, so it's not quite an ellipse, but you also see that, unfortunately, a lot of it is over international open waters, which then means that it becomes quite difficult in terms of radio regulatory enforcement. Uh, this has raised enough concern. If I speak to aviation aircraft operators, if I spoke to them 10 years ago about interference, they told me, go away, GPS always works. Now they're ringing the alarm bells. They're saying, look, we want GPS to work. It helps us a lot in our cockpits. Uh, please do something. And so you see here the measures that have been endorsed by ICAO as a result of uh, uh, the recent 40th assembly. I'll, I'll leave that to your reading pleasure and not go into detail in the interest of time. Um, what does this mean for us? Um, well, what I do wonder about is, do you need to, do these people that do this, okay, it's electronic warfare, it's linked to conflict zones, but do we really need to interfere with an aircraft at 300 kilometers away and at 10 kilometers altitude distance? Because, of course, as has been said already, jammers can be detected and locations can be determined. And we are developing this, these capabilities so that more and more we can actually see where the jamming is coming from. The thing that is worrying about this, uh, if, the, if the cockpit uh, messages haven't worried you enough, is that, well, you know, we have safety nets and a design that says, okay, if a single component fails, we don't really suffer too bad, we have backup, but then if ever multiple CNS elements are degraded, it becomes really difficult to maintain a safe operation. And this is especially challenging over international water where uh, ground-based service coverage is of course more difficult to achieve. Um, What we are developing and what we are pushing is that we have direct interference report at the receiver such that the pilot doesn't need to figure out whether it's uh, interference and then hopefully in future systems then report that to air traffic control such that we can actually pass that on to the radio regulator for enforcement. So that's something that we're working on that will take some time to develop. And of course, we need uh, to ensure safe and efficient operations, a balanced mix of both terrestrial and space-based CNS systems that will have to complement each other. The Article 15 procedures have been mentioned. Cyprus has written back in 2017 to the Radio Communication Bureau. Unfortunately, the aforementioned goodwill is not really present in the region. So, um, we would really hope that administrations in that region would actually react to such letters and, and actually try and see what they can do to reduce interference. Uh, what we really hope for, for aviation to continue benefiting from uh, these great systems that are put up uh, is that, well, can you please stop it or at least tune it down a bit? Uh, we don't see why such large zones of international open waters need to be interfered with. Also important to know, as soon as it is uh, a electronic warfare outside of a declared zone of conflict, we would consider that a training exercise that would have to be coordinated with aviation and maritime sectors because airplanes do fly over water and they do have air traffic control that they're dealing with in those places. 
What we also like to highlight is that this is a multi-sector problem. It's not just for aviation. There are many other uses of GNSS uh, that are benefiting citizens worldwide. And so these multi-sector problems also require multi-sector solutions uh, supported by ITU. Uh, things in the spectrum planning compatibility, of course, uh, are also things that need to be paid attention to, such as not putting powerful terrestrial signals close to space signals such that compatibility can be ensured, have enough guard bands, etc. And a lot can be done even if you're not from one of these conflict areas in your state. Uh, there are illegal jammers that you can buy on Amazon today and not much is being done to take these devices that are illegal everywhere uh, from the market. Usually there's a fine print somewhere that says it's the customer's responsibility to figure out whether it is illegal to operate in a given state. But of course, if you take the ITU treaty uh, rules, then these are not legal anywhere. Um, my thanks goes to my colleagues. Um, there's always people involved in this and uh, it's a good effort to keep these systems going and safe. You see here the many systems that and radio links that an aircraft relies on. Uh, they we're hoping to reduce those, but um, at the end of the day, what we need is a safe operation where air traffic controllers can guide pilots safely to their destination. And that would be the end of my presentation. It has one more slide that gives you links for further reading for those that look at the slides afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Gerard. Uh, yeah, we, we are extending in time, but certainly we have a uh, almost 500 participants still uh, with us, which is a, a quite good uh, sign. Uh, so if, if it is fine for you, maybe we'll make you a, one question. We are picking up here from the audience and then we can go to, to the panel to do one more question each one. So hopefully to, to end by 5 p.m. Uh, the question for, for you, Gerard, is, is how Eurocontrol solves the problem of jammers trying to put down drones by transmitting at the drone the GPS uh, frequencies? Yeah, that's that's a new issue. Um, lots of people are coming to us and asking what to do about it exactly. Um, we hear of a number of cases where, for example, police jammers have been authorized, but we have not really had uh, cases where they've really been used. So we have not seen what sort of collateral damage they could cause. What we would hope is to get more data from uh, the system designers of you know, such drone jam jammers. There is a standards working group busy with that, but we don't really have enough experience with the subject yet to give specific recommendations, but we're well aware that this is a, a difficult and, and, and complex issue. Okay, maybe so to replace this complex <laughs> issue question, I can pose you another quest difficult question as well, sorry, but this one is related to spoofing and cybersecurity. Uh, I don't know if you can elaborate a bit more on that. Uh, yeah, of course. So we, this is a, an even more sensitive topic. Mm -hmm. And so we, um, we study that topic, but of course we don't talk about it much. Uh, what you have seen uh, on the slides is that there are many systems in the aircraft. Uh, they also include inertial navigation systems. And our studies so far indicate uh, that uh, when it comes to spoofing, it is quite difficult to spoof an aircraft. Now, it is relatively easy to spoof an aircraft in an easy way, let's put it that way. There was a case in Hanover some years ago where a re-radiator, a GPS re-radiator, was badly adjusted. And that put an aircraft on approach on a static position. And of course, the pilot in flight does recognize um, that he's flying and that he's not static. And so he disregards this information right away. But to actually uh, mislead an aircraft in a hazardous way um, that is something that is, according to our studies and our knowledge at this point, still quite difficult to do. Um, but we are developing mitigation measures there as well. Um, and uh, it becomes very manufacturer specific. So we work closely with the manufacturers such that they can give recommendations to, to their operators on that topic. Thank you. 
So, well, we still have five or ten minutes. Um, if everybody is still with energy, maybe we could make one more question to to each panelist. So, as I said, we have a still a good audience, no, four hundred forty. So, so we need to to feed this audience, which are really interested in our our webinar. So, uh, one question could go for Glenn at NASA. Do you think, this is not so technical, but it's more about the space protocol. Uh, do you think that bringing the space protocol would help in reducing and regulating the space traffic? Ooh, space traffic. You know, that's that's one that uh, comes up from time to time. And it's a uh, certainly a uh, something that, in my mind, it kind of, it, it's, it's not a spectrum issue. I've always look things primarily as spectrum issues, uh, but space traffic is, it's getting busy up there. Um, it, it's also connected with the issue of orbital debris, which is also a very important issue. Um, but I haven't, uh, I, I generally try to separate those things from uh, the spectrum policies, which are really where I focus my attention on. Uh, but uh, I, we, we also are looking, you know, at, uh, for work nine, uh, work 23, there's agenda item 1.6. Uh, 1.6 is an interesting one, and NASA's been working actually in cooperation with our, uh, air, our, our regulatory authority for aeronautical systems, the FAA in the United States, uh, looking at suborbital vehicles and uh, how to coordinate launches within um, – uh, in national airspace and air traffic operations, you know, years ago it was if, if if somebody launched a rocket into space, it was on the evening news. Now it's happening so uh, often that it, it's it's not news at all unless there's something really exciting in in, in the pointy end of the rocket that's going into space. Um, and so it, it, you know, the the old protocols we had for well, a, a, a launch is a one off. And, you know, we can kind of, you know, coordinate these things with air traffic, uh, uh, you know, on a case-by-case -case basis is, is becoming kind of cumbersome now. So I think we do need to, uh, in particular, look for uh, launch events. Uh, you know, how do we better coordinate things? Uh, not necessarily, it's not necessarily a, a spectrum issue or an RFI issue, um, but there are uh, safety and, 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 and issues of routing, how, how, you, how you route things, and, and everybody knowing that, yes, there's, as you go, you have planes at high altitudes going left to right, you got rockets uh, punching a hole through that, through that plane of where the air traffic may be going. Um, so it, there, there are concerns there, and there are some things that we definitely need to look at. Okay. Thank you, Glenn. So, Elena, uh, you have described... Uh, a lot of efforts in, in terms of uh, reporting and, and trying to mitigate and mitigate in itself the RFI uh, for a small mission. And in, in, in your view, uh, which are the main lessons that you have learned from, from, from this experience? And you may share with the audience, of course. Thank you for the, the question, Jorge. <clears throat> I, I think that for the case of, of SMOS, one of the very first things that we were very thankful to the development team is the importance of the good selectivity. So it's extremely important for passive sensors, especially those operating in purely passive band, to have a good selectivity uh, to make sure that it's operating within the allocated band and minimizing to the maximum what is taken from the adjacent bands with active service. That was one of the very first lessons learned. Uh, we have realized also the importance of uh, putting together uh, the efforts to have a team for the RFI detection, mitigation, and reporting. That is time demanding, requires efforts, requires also cost, manpower, and uh, that is something that, in the case of SMOS, that was not foreseen, and that is quite common in space missions. That is not, is not part of the shopping list. And that is something that has been a lesson learned. And uh, finally, something that we have seen is that as far as all the RFI reporting is interesting, the most important is when you establish a good communication with the administration. That is what we have seen that really is what works and that is that follow-up of the cases. But at the end can be a, a happy story and uh, minimizing the, the RFIs. Thank you. 
Thank you, Elena. Uh, yes, that's uh, I'm trying to figure out. Maybe we will jump to Gerard now uh, because we don't have the same order, but uh, perhaps, uh, oh, that also sounds interesting. Uh, Gerard, there were some questions uh, related to uh, current issues relating to aviation systems of 5G or future 6G. Do you hear? Yeah, I hear. Yeah, so one of the current hot issues is uh, the development of 5G and the potential for interferences in the radio altimeter band from 4.2 to 4.4 uh, um, gigahertz. Uh, radio altimeters are used for um, the final phases of flight, so it's for um, measuring proximity to the runway and initiate the flare maneuver. Uh, and so this is, they're also used in other flight phases for other things, but this is one of our most safety critical systems. It's of course at the airport where it's being used, which is the same place where, where 5G operators understandably wish to deploy uh, 5G uh, base stations. Uh, so this is one where uh, that will need a lot of activity in the coming years to ensure that uh, 5G um, and radio altimeters get along, especially because, um, unfortunately, many passengers are not putting their phones into um, into airplane mode when they fly. And so as uh, the aircraft comes in for a landing and all these smartphones are coming into range of the base stations, uh, we don't want then all this uh, traffic being picked up with everybody uh, downloading emails. That can be a significant RF load. Uh, that is then uh, sent directly to the aircraft. So those are things where, of course, uh, we need future uh, more, more coordination and cooperation to make sure we have interference-free operations. One thing that I'd like to point out is that mobile broadband is linked to mobility. And so from that, air transport, land transport, sea transport should really be seen as a partner in mobile broadband and that of course we need to make sure that all of our systems work together to provide a good mobile experience to be it the traveling public or uh, essential government services. Okay, thank you. So the last one I think is a very easy one or well, very easy one to say and we'll go for uh, Ethan because uh, considering the time we, we, we should start to, to, to stop but uh, we can just answer one more uh, about the geolocation. Uh, you, you spoke about it, and well, we more or less know. But uh, there are some participants who are asking more uh, if you can explain how to uh, obtain or geolocate a source of interference uh, in the app link. Okay. Yes, that's, I noticed as well that there was a number of questions on the chat. So, could you could I put a diagram on the on the screen? Is that possible right now? Right. Okay, so uh, let me go back to the first one. So this is a diagram from a, uh, well, I'm taking it shamefully, shamelessly from a seminar symposium that was in Geneva. It's, uh, it's by the, uh, the operator of the Lehan uh, station uh, run by the, the German administrator. Uh, so, so I use it without his permission, but I'm sure he wouldn't mind. And this shows a, a scenario uh, of, of sharing, uh, of, sharing, of uh, geolocation. Uh, it's called a, they call their system is a transmitter location system. So you have the the main station on the on the on the lower left, which is the actual monitoring station, which is part of the the uh, memorandum of cooperation of the ITU. You have the uh, the interfered satellite, which is which is being interfered in the uplink by the interferer on the right. You have a neighboring satellite, which also receives part of that interfering signal, even though it's it's a very low level. But but of course, no antenna is perfect, so it bleeds over to the um, to the other satellite. And you can receive both of those signals at the space radio monitoring station. You also can add, if you want, and it's not necessary, uh, mobile reference transmitters, which will further increase the accuracy. And those can be located mobily over here, just to give another another point. And, and it's kind of a little bit the same kind of calculation that a GPS would use to, to give your location on the ground uh, in a GPS handset. Uh, it's quite relevant from, from what we just heard before. But of course, it was never intended. Uh, you're using uh, uh, 
information which is normally not useful or that you just extrapolate to, to find a, a position. Whereas, of course, GPS the signals are, are perfectly tuned to actually precisely pinpoint your location. So that's basically how it works. Uh, to add to that, I mentioned in my presentation that you are now, we're now in, uh, putting on the satellite payload uh, equipment that can even more accurately with just a single satellite, a single interfered satellite can actually tell where exactly the um, interferers come from. And it's strange how that came about. It came about because those same satellites also are able to put blanking. Uh, so nulls in their satellite, in their, in their uh, electronic uh, uh, array uh, satellites. So of course, once you're going to put something that blanks, uh, puts a null in the in the receive diagram to null out to the location where there's a where there's, a, there's a, an interferer. Well, then of course you also know precisely where that interferer is, and you can communicate that information. So, so what that gives you this is I this is this is some this is a forty page presentation and a full day on a two day seminar. So, so obviously I'm just giving you a few excerpts, but this shows. Uh, some tests that were made. Uh, this is around Paris, Rambouillet, which is on, on the which is on the left. That's uh, that's uh, one of our Utelsat sites. We also had the uh, Bersenay on Haute. That's uh, that's a France Telecom site. But these were just cooperative uh, experiments to show uh, validate the geolocation. And you see two different ellipses: a long one and, and then a smaller one. I, I won't go into the details, but but uh, it's just showing how different uses different elements of the system can give you increasingly uh, precise uh, uh, pinpointing of, uh, of where the location of the transmitter. These weren't real interferers. These were just pretend interferers, of course. We don't interfere from our, our Earth station in, in Rambouillet eventually ever. But you'll see that there's a, that the, 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 the smaller ellipse is actually quite small if you look at the scale of the map. It's, it's, uh, it's you know, so, so you have already a quite a good uh, idea uh, even from just without any any further um, equipment on board, specialized equipment on the satellite, just from what's already up on the sky, you get a very good uh, uh, location uh, estimation as to where the the emitter is. And, and so that's. I, I hope that answers the question. To go into further detail, I would. I would. Uh, I think there's there's uh, plenty of information that you can look at to get the full technical technical um, uh, scope of, of what's actually done. But but this is a basic concept. I think it, it was a very good graphic uh, visualization of, of uh, and, and the answer was was good. So uh, we are at the end now, and I would like to share uh, the results of the poll we launched during these uh, almost two hours uh, of, of webinar. Uh, we land, we started ten minutes late, just waiting for the full connection of, of audience. So during this poll. We have launched, uh, there were 58% of, of the audience who have uh, participated, and the first question was dedicated to to know your views if the interference environment is going to affect satellite systems in the, in the coming year, how it would be. And 76% of the audience answered that it would be more complex with higher interference incidents. These are your views. Uh, the second question was about uh, is the, is the current international regulatory framework sufficient to resolve the cases of harmful interference that cannot be prevented through the usual coordination and notification procedures? And in this case, 50% said uh, no. Additional measures could be included under ITU legal instruments and radio regulation. And the last question, uh, it was about uh, what do you think if non-GSO constellation will bring a new pattern of interference cases? And for this last question, there was 54% which said, surely the transient nature of the interference created by a non-geo system will change the way the impact of interference will be assessed. So these are very important mm -hmm. uh, insights from you, from the audience. As we said, we were uh, today 550 uh, participants, and we are really happy and proud and thank all of you for, for such a important participation from the industry, from the governments, and especially for the speakers, for your time. We will spend even one more hour because each of your subjects deserves even more uh, uh, detailed uh, discussions, but unfortunately, we have to stop now. We are already 45 minutes. And again, thank you all. And uh, well, don't forget that this is just the very first uh, episode. We'll have a next one. In, the, in October, 7th of October, dedicated to NGSO constellations for, for product and applications. And again, thank you so much and have a wonderful day or night.